of the 60s. Uh, he's now a professor of sociology, specializing in sociology of communications at the University of California at Berkeley. He's written a number of books, uh, Inside Prime Time, The 60s, Years of Rage, pardon me, The 60s, Years of Hope, and Days of Rage. Edited a collection uh, which fits tonight's topic, Watching Television. Uh, my favorite uh, remembrance of reading an article by uh, Mr. Gitland was one in which he discusses uh, with a, an editor of the New York Times their coverage of the Vietnam War. And the uh, New York Times editor was pointing out at some length that everything that was covered in the underground press uh, was also covered at some point somewhere in the Times. Uh, in the analysis, and I think this is what uh, Gitlin has been particularly useful to me for. Uh, in the analysis, he points out uh, where it was covered in the Times uh, on back pages, how it was covered in the Times, barely, if at all, and how the Times went on to base its regular news reporting not on that information they published once in a while on back pages, but to go back to government handouts, which they'd already totally brought into question by earlier news pronouncements buried on those back pages. In any case, he's a man who not only watches the media, uh, but analyzes it with some theory and in some depth. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming Todd Gitlin. Do, do I need this thing do I, you, for recording? Yeah? Oh, this one is. What, what does this sound like? Is that all right? No. This is the mic for... This is... The, boy, the acoustics from back to front are horrible. I can't hear a word you're saying. For the room. Yeah, and I'm wondering how I do without it. Am I audible in the back row? Okay, I'm going to try to do it without this because I think it's um, quite distorting. But if at some point I start to flag... Will somebody please wave and tell me to um, acquire electronic equipment? I'll try to do it without it. Pardon? Okay, we'll try it. Um, one other piece of uh, prologue. I, um, I'm going to talk about some aspects of the relation between television and American politics in recent years, but really what interests me about media is not uh, media as such, but the way in which media take us to the heart of everything that is problematic and interesting in contemporary life. Uh, I first got interested in the media, I think, because it was a way of thinking, because the study of the media was a way of thinking what was about what was happening politically, which is a long way of saying that I want to be uh, held accountable for anything I might say about uh, anything about media or politics. And so when we get to the question period, please don't feel confined to the subject of this talk when you ask questions. I'd be happy to talk to the best of my ability about any aspect of media or politics, okay? So uh, please surprise me. Um, Actually, before I start the talk, I, I want to uh, offer a, a sermon, uh, I suppose, or a text, I, I should say, a text on the basis of which my talk is a sermon. I tore this ad out of the current issue of the Columbia Journalism Review. It says over here, it says, tired of the same old party line? And then it says, you won't find it in... Campaigns and Elections, the magazine for media, for, sorry, the magazine for political professionals. It's where the best in the business put their feet up, let their hair down, and talk shop. Atwater, Rollins, Ailes, Squire, Inside Politics, Not for Public Consumption. James T. Kilpatrick calls, the way, calls campaigns and elections the wave of the political future. Campaigns and Elections is your best source for news, opinion, and insight on the booming business of politics. The booming business of politics. Every issue cuts through the party line to give you the bottom line. 
on who's hot and who's not in the cutthroat world of professional politics. The Washington Post calls campaigns and elections the industry's leading journal. The industry's leading journal. Tactics, strategies, behind the scenes power plays and profiles of the power players who make them. Every issue of campaigns and elections delivers the deep background you need to stay ahead of the pack. And subscribe now and so on and so on. Your sources don't make a move without campaigns and elections. Why should you? And note that this is an ad appearing in the issue of probably the uh, widest circulating magazine read by American journalists, the Columbia Journalism Review. And this ad expresses uh, much of what I was planning to talk about here. Some of you may remember the 1987 television series that ABC did called Max Headroom. Any of you remember the late lamented Max Headroom? You may remember the pilot in particular, which was the best of it, in which an investigative reporter discovers that it, an advertiser is compressing television commercials into uh, almost, simul almost uh, uh, instantaneous blipverts which are units so high-powered that this investigative observer discovers uh, can cause some viewers to explode. And what I want to talk about is the significance of the fact that American television has long been compressing politics into blipverts, chunks, 10-second bites, as we have learned to call them, and images that appear instantaneously and become virtually the whole of what we understand about the political world. So, for example, the 1980s were filled with these sort of magic moments. Uh, Ronald Reagan at the DMZ in Korea wearing a flak jacket and field glasses, keeping an eye on North Korean communists. Or Reagan in the bunker at Omaha Beach simulating the wartime performance he had actually spared himself during the actuality of World War II. <laughs> or the American medical student kissing American soil after the troops had evacuated him from Grenada, or Star Wars animation cartoons, or Oliver North saluting. This sense of history as a sort of collage um, reaches some sort of twilight or acne uh, when we think of the 1988 election, where it is hard to remember anything but blips and bites. Um, the Pledge of Allegiance, George Bush touring the garbage of Boston Harbor, which of course hadn't been shot in Boston Harbor at all. Um, the famous mismatch of Tank and Michael Dukakis. Um, and probably most memorable of all, the face of Willie Horton. The question I want to raise here is whether this sort of media have caused democratic politics to explode. I pose the question in an extreme way. But the first thing I want to point out about the question is that it's hard, the way, this way of asking the question is hardly alien to 1988's endless campaign journalism. In fact, during the campaign itself, journalists were obsessed with the question of whether media images had become the campaign. And if so, what that meant and whose fault it might be. And I'm going to come back to that obsession that the media professionals had with the coverage itself. But first I want to talk about the coverage. We don't need the endless, uh, endlessly relentless studies of the content of the campaign to demonstrate what we already know. Namely, that the main kind of television coverage, the main kind of story that appeared during the campaign just as was the case in 1984, just as was the case in 1980, is the horse race story. The story about who's ahead, who's behind, who's gaining. Uh, no one would deny it. I raised the, this question, I, as I, I made a criticism of this in a conversation with a uh, 60 Minutes producer in 1980. And he said, he scratched his head and he said, I know, we know this is what's going on. We really don't like it. We're trying to think of some other way to do it. And every year, ritually, after the campaign, op-ed columns fill with anguished media professionals 
declaring that they know that they're reporting the horse race story and that this isn't really very educational, not very helpful to the democratic process, and they promise us they're going to do something different next time. Um, funny thing, they don't do something different, and I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, I don't think it's possible for them to do anything different. In fact, one thing that's striking about the metaphors that are used to talk about American politics is the, de is the degree to which they reflect the addiction that the very metaphor horse race displays. Consider, for example, the idea of a political uh, 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 enterprise as a race. The very notion of the race already puts us in sports territory. Uh, likewise, the language of campaign puts us in military territory. We're already, in other words, pointed toward thinking of politics as something that draws on athletic world and uh, and the military world. Here is that preoccupation with means, with technique, which is characteristic of a society that is competitive, bureaucratic, professional, and high-tech all at once. Um, this is, of course, a success culture, as a few hours in front of television on Sunday rapidly remind me. Uh, empty of criteria other than numbers to answer the question of what is it value, what is of value, or how am I doing. Journalists compete with themselves, news organizations compete. All of these enterprises are running on a sort of adrenaline that comes from or is familiar to us from the world of sports. In the absence of a vital political system, what reporters know how to do is to take polls, is to assess how somebody is doing. On one night during the 1988 campaign, ABC News devoted 14 minutes, which is almost two-thirds of its entire news hall, to an analysis of one poll uh, that they themselves uh, had, had taken. The, um, in a curious way, the journalist's fascination with polls represents, I think, a misguided attempt at mastering a situation in which they find themselves to be passive and dependent. Here, at least, is something they know how to do, something they can be good at without defying their starting premise, which is, in this culture, deference. The characteristic stance of American journalism is what I think of as insouciant subservience. Um, it, 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 it knows how to yell, as in the manner of a, of a Sam Donaldson, but it always is yelling within the framework that is already being presented by whatever powers that be. Um, there's a mixture of obsequiousness and fatalism. It is, journalists constantly remind us, not their business to affront authorities, not their business to analyze the world. It is their business to report on what the movers and shakers are moving and shaking. It is not their place to declare that someone is lying and someone is not. It is their place to offer a pulpit, a platform, and to force the authorities to clarify themselves. But it is not their place to argue. Starting from the premise that journalists don't have the right to raise issues which the candidates don't raise, starting from the premise that journalists don't have the right to explore records that the candidates don't explore, the one thing journalists think they know how to do and feel entitled to do is to ask the question, who's ahead? In other words, they're racing addicts. Now, what's interesting is that by 1988, everything I've said so far was already old news. Um, the fact that the horse race had become the principal story. And reporters talked about that fact endlessly. Many of them had finally figured out something they could do differently. And that was to take the audience backstage, to go behind the horse race, into the stables, into the clubhouse, into the bookie joints, and to join horse race coverage with what I think of as handicapping coverage, the sort of coverage that this magazine is offering journalists. Not just who's ahead and who's behind and who's gaining, but how are the candidates trying to position themselves in relation to other candidates? 
How are the candidates doing at that? What sorts of tactical and strategic calculations are they making? There was anxiety in, underneath this new style, reflected by the fact that they already knew that Ronald Reagan had pulled the, or I'm sorry, that, that Reagan had pulled the Teflon over their eyes, or rather that they had equipped him with it, that they had been suckered, in other words, and I'll come back to this, by the smooth working machinery of his stagecraft. So handicapping coverage was a sort of defensive maneuver and a self-flattering one. The media could show that they were immune from all the massage they were getting from campaign professionals. They could report on the campaign professionals themselves. So the result is what many people call a postmodern move. Um, there's a lot of this in American culture today, a fascination with the machinery of backdrops, the fascinating with the way in which things are produced, showing us the skeleton of the building outside the building. Um, paintings calling attention to the fact that they're only paintings and that sort of thing. Novels exposing their novelistic machinery. You may remember the aspirin commercial, which dizzyingly toys with itself. A, an actor appears wearing a white coat and he says, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Um, well, is he or isn't he? Uh, or the, the Joe Isuzu commercial, which bids for trust by using subtitles to expose the lying pitchman. Or actors facing the audience and speaking out of character uh, in moonlighting and so on. Campaign coverage in 1988 reveled in this mode in which viewers were asked, in effect, to participate in the process of their own bamboozlement. Because this was the campaign that made terms like soundbite, spin control, spin doctor, and handler into household phrases. The Dukakis handlers even, you may remember, made a commercial about bush handlers wringing their hands about how to market Dan Quayle. A, co uh, a commercial that went over much better with, with a hip audience than with the unhip audience who had trouble figuring out that it was a Dukakis commercial. I, I, I want to call this sort of coverage or this sort of, of media phenomenon meta-coverage, coverage of the coverage. And uh, just to underscore that it partakes of this postmodern fascination with surfaces and with the machinery that produces them. And I want to argue that that fascination is indistinguishable from surrender. As if once we understood that all images are made up, all images are concocted, we had achieved wisdom. We see this all the time. I, I, I don't know if any of you saw a few minutes of the, um, of the McLaughlin report today. These guys are always doing that sort of thing. Um, so one way in which television conducted meta coverage during the, the 88 campaign was with voiceovers that explained knowingly that the candidate was, let's say, going to the flag factory or driving a tank in order to, in order to make public relations points. So for example, here is ABC's Brit Hume narrating Bush's appearance at the flag factory on September 20th, 1988. Picture of Bush at the flag factory, Brit Hume. Bush aides deny he came here to wrap himself in the flag, but if that wasn't the point of this visit, what was it? Well, we've seen it more recently in the case of coverage of Bush on vacation, or frantically golfing and boating, while a knowing uh, correspondent reminds you that Bush is going to the trouble of establishing an impression that the crisis in the Persian Gulf leaves him unfazed without having any awareness, of course, that that impression is precisely what is being relayed through television. So the voiceover, that meta coverage is an attempt at taking the sting out of that sort of display. Um, in the same vein, we had a new sort of post-debate ritual during the 88 campaign. The networks brought campaign spin doctors working for the candidates on camera immediately after the debate to tell reporters why their candidates had done just very well, thank you. 
and why they had accomplished exactly what they had set out to accomplish. While print reporters who were interviewed also before they'd even written their articles um, were insisting that, the, they are, that they were completely unspinnable. Spin doctors couldn't lay a hand on them. And meanwhile, the, these presumably unspinnable pundits were rattling on about how the, their candidates had done, whether they had gotten the proper sound bites across. They were, in a sense, reviewing, I'm sorry, while the correspondents were, in a sense, reviewing the performances, um, talking about what would be remembered and so on, which meant that if the spin doctors had established low expectations beforehand, then correspondents were in a position of feeling uh, uh, honest about reporting that the candidates had done better than expected. So that if Dan Quayle succeeded in speaking in complete sentences, he was taken to have done better than expected against uh, what's his name. These rituals e express what I call the insouciant side of insouciant subservience. Reporters here are dancing attendance at the campaign ball while insisting that they're actually following their own beat. Now, the other sort of thing they might do, namely evaluating the candidates' claims and their records, was considered highbrow and boring, and potentially worse. Because to probe too far into issues, or to show initiative in stating the public's problems and asking how the candidates are doing at them, would be seen by the news business as hubris, as crossing the, invisual, the invisible line that separates them from the government, a violation of their unwritten agreement to let the candidates set the public agenda, which means that when the candidates collude in keeping issues off the public agenda, the media are happy to permit them to do so. Um, as befit this new self-consciousness, as displayed in the meta coverage. Reporters sometimes displayed a certain awareness that they had become players in a game not of their own scripting and that they were uncomfortable about it. They, and were in fact tired of being had by the handlers. This one story in particular has been much discussed, but I think the main point of it has been lost. It's a story that was first told by a, a reporter named Hedrick Smith in a book published in 1984 called The Power Game. It subsequently has been retold several times. And it's about a piece done for CBS in 1984 by Leslie Stahl. Um, what I'm about to quote to you is Leslie Stahl's own version of the story as she told it on one of those ABC Viewpoint shows the night after the 88 election. This is Leslie Stahl's voice. This was a five-minute piece, she says, on the evening news at the end of President Reagan's 84 campaign. And the point of the piece was to really criticize him for, I didn't use this language in the piece, but the point was he was trying to create amnesia over the budget cuts. For instance, I showed him at the handicapped Olympics, and I said, you wouldn't know by these pictures that this man tried to cut the budget for the handicapped. And the piece went on and on like that. It was very tough. And I was very nervous about going back to the White House the next day, Sam, she's talking to Sam Donaldson, who's on the panel with her, because I thought they'd never return my phone calls and they'd keep returning yours. But my phone rang and it was a White House official. I have it from, a, I think, unimpeachable source that that was the president head of the Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Darman. It was a White House official and he said, great piece, Leslie. And I said, come on, that was a tough, what do you mean, great piece? And he said, we loved it, we loved it, we loved it. Thank you very much. It was a five-minute commercial, you know, unpaid commercial for our campaign. I said, didn't you hear what I said? I was tough. Nobody heard what you said, he says. They just saw the five minutes of beautiful pictures of Ronald Reagan. They saw the balloons, they saw the flags, they saw the red, white, and blue. Haven't you people figured out yet that the picture always overrides what you say? Well, apparently not. For the networks and the candidates in 1988, and I think it's a safe prediction this will remain true, share an interest in what they collectively consider great pictures. That is, images that are simple to interpret and instantly evoke myths. 
Curiously, although journalists like to affect a cynical attitude, that is, they want you to believe that they're deeply skeptical, this does not keep them at all from being gullible. Um, the handlers count on the gullible side when they gamble that the cameras will show up whenever the candidates appear. That's why the Reagan staffers were so proud of their little public relations triumphs and so proud of their success at producing what one of them called our little playlets, far-flung photo opportunities with real-life backdrops. Um, and print reporters, although not ostensibly dependent on visual images in the same way, were unable or unwilling to proceed differently. The print people are unwilling to cede the playlets to television. They want to show up, which means that they let the handlers set their agendas for them. Now, what is not altogether clear is whether Darman was right and the rest of them were right to be proud of their, to be so proud of their public relations triumphs. We don't know, in fact, that the picture always overrides what you say. Possibly that is true for some audiences at some times, in some places, and not for others. But what is clear is that when the picture is stark enough or the bite is vivid enough, Journalists are unwilling to forgo the drama because to them, to be boring is the cardinal sin. I knew we had entered the post-modern media age when at an appearance at UCLA um, in, uh, during the 1984 campaign, Walter Mondale was greeted with boos of boring, and that was the last word. That was all that needed to be said. Not wrong. Um, So in a funny way, what I'm trying to say is that this meta coverage was a misguided attempt on the part of the media to catch up to the handlers because the handlers had been running rings about them. But I want to argue that this sort of meta coverage uh, reflects something much deeper and in a way more sinister about what has happened to American politics. But in order to do that, I, I have to now open out, as they say um, in Hollywood. Um, and to look at what I'm going to argue is the dominant form of political consciousness in a society which is formally open but fundamentally depoliticized and politically stagnant. And that dominant form of political consciousness is savviness. It's the air of being knowing. And you can see it every week if you watch the, McLa the McLaughlin report. Um, this air of knowingness is not brand new. It, was, it has been noticed uh, at earlier times in American history and in fact was already observed in the marvelous, I think, uh, and, and still to be reread book by the sociologist David Reisman published in 1950 called The, the, the Lonely Crowd. In The Lonely Crowd, Reisman identifies a certain sort of, of act a certain sort of figure in American life whom he calls the inside dopester, uh, who is basically a consumer of politics, who, and I'm quoting Reisman here, may be one who has concluded with good reason that since he can do nothing to change politics, he can only understand it. Or he may see all political issues in terms of being able to get some insider on the telephone. He is politically cosmopolitan, he will go to great lengths to keep from looking and feeling like the looking and feeling like the uninformed outsider. The goal is never to be taken in. And I want to argue that in the last 40 years, this inside dopester has evolved into a still harsher and more brittle and cynical type, who is still more knowing, uh, still more allergic to. Uh, political seriousness and whose premium attitude is a sort of knowing appraisal, a sort of sizing up. In this mood, speaking up is less important than sizing up. Politics, real politics, is for another amazing piece of media language of the last few years, players. Fascinating term because it implies that everyone else is a spectator. Somebody, let, many people have complained, I think, uh, rightly, that Nightline is a show in which the figures who are deemed newsworthy are members of former administrations. And a Ted Koppel producer uh, admitted to this several years ago and said quite baldly, Ted is more comfortable with the former players. Well, everyone in that media world is more comfortable with 
the present and former players. Um, so then in this mood, to be interested in politics is to know how to rate the players. Do they have good hands? How do they do in the clutch? I watched a bit of the tennis match from Forest Hills today, and I heard a sort of commentary about how this guy was doing, and whether he was up for the big matches, did he fall apart in the big matches, and it sounded virtually indistinguishable from the sort of conversations that you may already remember from being in Iowa during the caucuses, and, and I'm sure you'll have cause to hear again. How are they positioning themselves for the next set match campaign? Savviness flatters spectators that they really do understand, that people like them are in charge, and that even if they live outside the beltway, they remain in some way sovereign. So then keeping up with the maneuvers of Washington insiders and defining the issues as they define them, savviness appears to, appeals to a spirit which is both managerial, that is, politics is a matter of managing problems, and voyeuristic. It transmutes the desire to participate into spectacle. One is already participating, in effect, by watching. I like to watch TV might as well be the motto in this stage of American political life. And the ultimate inside dopesters are the political journalists. Today, both political advertising and coverage flourish on and suffer from what my colleague Mark Crispin Miller has called the hipness unto death. Uh, Miller has argued that television advertising, not just political advertising, but t TV advertising as a whole, has learned to profess its power by apparently mocking it, by standing aside from vulgar claims and assuring the viewer that all of us are too knowing to be taken in by advertising, um, too smart, um, or indeed too smart to be taken in by any sort of passion or direct statement. And in this way, the postmodern savviness of political coverage likewise binds its audience closer to an eerie politics of half-truth, deceit, and evasion. If the players evade an issue, then the savvy spectator knows enough to lose interest of it as well. So co coverage of the horse race and meta coverage of the handicappers both suit this discourse of haviness, of savviness. They invite and cultivate an inside dopester's attitude toward politics, which is made up of vicarious fascination coupled with knowing indifference. So it may well be that this famous now piece of Leslie Stahl from 1984 was really three pieces. Um, a critical audience, probably a large part of the audience, got the point she thought she was making. Reagan is a hypocrite. There was a second audience who got Darman's point, that Reagan personified national will and caring. And inside dopesters got still another point, namely that Reagan, the master performer, was impervious to whatever voiceovers sought to modify what he was saying. Now, I, I just referred to an image-minded audience that got Reagan's point, and I have to say a word about that. Um, in 1988, of course, we had not only meta coverage, we had the negative commercial, the bite, the image clip, and the sound bite, which is sm uh, shorter than ever. Uh, average sound bite on the network news now is under 10 seconds. Now, in theory, these sorts of chunks are the thing that television knows how to do distinctly and to do best. These emotion-laden images, which take an entire narrative and put it in one image the flag, Willie Horton, Bush with his granddaughter. Um, the image is what is riveting. Ronald Limbo, who uh, did his PhD with me at Berkeley and is now teaching in Amherst College, uh, did a lot of research with people watching television and discovered that there were basically two ways in which people watch television. Some people watch uh, paying attention to the narrative. If you stop them at any given moment and ask them, what's going on on this soap opera or on Dallas or something like that, they can tell you, oh, that's so-and-so, sister, and so-and-so. Um, other people pay very little attention to the narrative and might not be able to answer that question, but what they do remember are images. What they do remember are particular moments 
you know, that shot. They're very savvy about camera placement and sound and so on. Disproportionately, the second audience, the image-centered audience, is younger than the other audience, which is, I think, an ominous uh, possibility. It suggests an ominous possibility I'd like to be talked out of. What professional handlers and television journalists alike do is to find images that condense their little playlets. And then that television floods the audience with them. Uh, these images can be extremely powerful. They can become the dominant sources of, if we can use this term, political education. The 1980s began with one of these, namely the blindfolded American who was a long-running star of uh, the melodrama called America Held Hostage, which ran for 63 weeks during 1970, starting in November 1979 and running through January of 1981, which day after day propounded the image of America as a pitiful, helpless giant. Richard Nixon's phrase. Those were the months when Walter Cronkite signed off at CBS night after night by ticking off that this was the 18th or 81st or 162nd or 412th night of the captivity of the American hostages in Iran. In that ceremony of innocence violated, the moment arose to efface the national brooding over Vietnam. And now it could be seen that it was the anti-Americans who were really ugly, and that Americans were pale faces captive of redskins. The image then cried out for a man to ride in out of the sagebrush on a white horse into the White House. I don't want to argue that the script for the Tehran playlet was written by the Reagan handlers, although uh, I wouldn't want to say that they were unhappy about it. But it certainly was clear how that script was going to end. Reagan was, of course, or I should say his handlers, were particularly good at managing those sorts of images. Um, and, and yet, I think people were mistaken in the 80s by talking about Reagan as the definitive television president. Memories are short. People are forgetting that Jack Kennedy was considered the definitive television president, and so was the um, late lamented Jimmy Carter. I think that television is actually much more absorptive and complicated than it's sometimes given credit for. You remember not too long ago, George Bush was considered a hopeless candidate, somebody who was completely unintelligent, and he seems to be doing very well, thank you, at managing his images. Um, so television is peculiarly adept for, for conveying images in the political sphere which uh, seem to compress a whole sort of morality tale into one ineffable moment. And what I want to turn to now is the question of how new this is. Because it, it may seem from what I'm saying so far that television is the this overriding, brooding, uh, all but irresistible force that, con that distorted and corrupted what used to be a solid uh, democratic political process. But that's not at all where I'm going. Um, politics before television was not virginal. Alarm is amply justified, but not because American politics has fallen from some pastoral of lucid debate when everyone spent campaign years standing in the cornfields listening to Lincoln-Douglas debates. Television did not invent the, superior, the sorry, superficiality, the triviality, the treachery of American politics. Infotainment is in the American grain, and so is campaign's reduction of politics to triviality and spectacle. And so is high-minded revulsion against both. Is negative campaigning new? In 1828, the supporters of Andrew Jackson charged, and this was their principal campaign endeavor, charged that John Quincy Adams had slept with his wife before marrying her, and that while ambassador to Russia, Adams had supplied the czar with a young American mistress. In turn, the pro-Adams newspapers accused Jackson of adultery, gambling, cockfighting, bigamy, slave trading, drunkenness, theft, lying, and murder. 
Jackson was said to be the offspring of a prostitute's marriage to a mulatto. Papers accused Jackson's previously divorced wife of having moved in with him while still married to her first husband. I don't mean to say that all negative campaigns work. Some mud makes the slinger slip. In 1884, a Protestant minister called the Democrats the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion, as the Republican candidate, James G. Blaine, stood by at the same platform without demurring. And some historians think that his own refusal to distance himself from that remark uh, may well have cost Blaine the election. Is the personality, is the preference for personality over issues new? The aforementioned Andrew, aforementioned Andrew Jackson, once elected president, set to wiping out Indian tribes. But this was not an issue in the campaign that elected him, any more than the New Deal was an issue in the campaign that elected Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. In fact, Roosevelt campaigned for a balanced budget. Are the soundbite and the image blip new? Tippecanoe and Tyler II, the leading slogan of 1840, does not exactly constitute a Lincoln-Douglas debate. That year, followers of William Henry Tippecanoe Harrison carried log cabins in parades, circulated log cabin bandanas and banners, gave away log cabin pins, and sang log cabin songs, all meant to evoke the humble origins of their candidate. Although Harrison had been born to prosperity and had lived only briefly in any log cabin at all. A half a century later, 1896, uh, the, f the first campaign manager to be celebrated in his own right, Mark Hanna, who was McKinley's chief handler, acquired the reputation of a phrase maker for giving the world such bites as the advance agent of prosperity, full dinner pail, and poverty or prosperity, which were circulated on the mass media of the time, namely billboards, posters, cartoons, and envelope stickers. Hannah, and I quote, has advertised McKinley as if he were a patent medicine, marveled that earnest student of modern techniques, the vice presidential candidate, Mr. Theodore Roosevelt. In that watershed year, professional management made its appearance, and both candidates threw themselves for the first time into a whirl of public activity. Um, now, the, the striking thing is that during the, most of the campaigns that I talked about, political participation in this country was vast. The average turnout from 18 to 24, from eight, sorry, from 1824 to 1836 was 48% of eligible voters. Eligible, of course, here meant white male. But from 1876 to 1900, it went skyrocketing to 77%. In fact, during the three decades after the Civil War, there were mass rallies which commonly lasted for many hours. There were torchlight parades. There were campaign clubs and marching groups. More than one-fifth of northern voters probably played an active part in the campaign organizations of each presidential contest during the 70s and 80s writes one historian. And with popular mobilization came high voter turnout. Up to 84% of the eligible, still all-male, no longer all-white, electorate in 1896 and 1900, before it slid to 75% during the years 1900 to 1916, and then still further to 58% in 1920 through 24. And by the way, it rose during the Great Depression and then started sliding again and has been sliding ever since. Arguably, it was the mass mobilization and the hoopla that turned out the vote. In other words, voting was here seen not as a sort of private act of duty, but as part of a whole style of political activity. Well, in the age of professionalization, reformers recoiled. And what developed in the 1870s and 1880s was a sort of didactic politics, a politics of, of the right-minded, high-minded reformers who insisted on the importance of the secret ballot, who approved of social science techniques, and wanted enlightened leaders to guide the unwashed. They worked toward a new style campaign which they called the campaign of education, in which independent journalism would be an important part. That is, 
journalism that would be separated from the parties, would no longer be subsidized by the parties. So that two new kinds of newspapers emerged. On the one hand, the high-minded independent paper with its educated tone, and on the other, the low-minded sensational paper with its lurid tone, cultivating a sort of anti-political passion. And you can see that the way is already open to our contemporary bifurcation. The New York Times and the New York Post. McNeil Lehrer and Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> I believe that this sharply bifurcated media helped divide the public. And to oversimplify, I want to argue that it corresponds to a situation in which a progressive middle class takes politics seriously as insiders, while a diverted, largely working class is, for the most part, except during the Great Depression, disaffected so that the elements of the contemporary political campaign are already in place at the turn of the century. Emphasis on the personality of the candidate and not the party. Emphasis on the national campaign and not community events. A campaign of packaging, posed pictures, and slogans. In other words, politics as a sort of discretionary, episodic activity for the majority alongside a moral politics for the few. In short, the politics of the consumer society. And everything that followed during the age of radio and newsreels up to the television age continues the process. Of course, only with television and the proliferation of primaries did media management become central and routine to political campaigns. And this is an important difference. In 1952, Eisenhower, whose campaign was the first to buy television spots, was at first reluctant to advertise at all. In 1956, a very funny story, Adlai Stevenson summoned his TV consultant in the middle of the Democratic Convention to ask him to fix his set. That's what he thought a TV consultant was for. Um, after 1960, it was only after 1960, when Kennedy's defeat of Nixon was attributed in some quarters 